while we are um, getting the slides ready, let me do a very brief introduction of a new good friend of NHGRI's, uh, Josh Gordon. Uh, Josh is the relatively new director of the National Institute of Mental Health, or NIMH, and as all of you I'm sure know, NIMH is a lead federal agency for research on mental disorders. Let me just tell you a few biographical details about Dr. Gordon. Uh, he received a combined MD-PH degree from the University of California in San Francisco. Um, during his PhD thesis, he pioneered methods for studying brain plasticity in the mouse visual system. He then pursued psychi psychiatry residency and research fellowship at Columbia University, where he studied the role of the hippocampus, the brain structure known to be important for memory and emotional processes associated with anxiety and depression. Uh, then in 2004, he joined the faculty at Columbia University as an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry. Of course, moved up, as I'm going to tell you about in a minute. At Columbia University, uh, Dr. Gordon's research focused on the analysis of neural activities in mice carrying mutations of relevance in psychiatric disease. His lab studied genetic models of these diseases from an integrative neuroscience perspective, focused on understanding how a given disease mutation leads to behavioral phenotype across multiple levels of analysis. This research obviously has direct relevance to schizophrenia, anxiety disorders, and depression. In addition to his research, uh, Dr. Gordon was an associate director of the Columbia University New York State Psychiatric Institute Adult Psych Psychiatry Residency Program where he directed the neuroscience curriculum and administered research training programs for residents. He also maintained a general psychiatric practice caring for patients who suffer from the illnesses he studied in his laboratory at Columbia University. Needless to say, he earned many awards and honors uh, in his still rather young career. Um, but when it came time to recruit a new director for NIMH, he was an obvious target and we were delighted um, that uh, he was willing to come uh, to D.C. and take the helm of this very important institute, and actually an institute that has a long history of having very good relationships uh, with a uh, relationship with NHGRI, and, uh, and it's quickly become apparent that that's going to continue to be the case under his leadership as well. So we wanted to get him in front of this council so you can all get to know him the way I'm getting to know him, and we can continue to explore ways to synergize our, uh, the research agendas of the two institutes. So Josh, I'll kick it over to you. Thanks, Eric, for that introduction. And uh, thank you all for uh, members of the council for um, committing your uh, time and effort to ensuring that NHGRI is well steered, which I know it is under Eric's helm. Um, I want to say at the outset that the presentation I'm going to give you is a, sort of a general update, slightly tailored to the interests, or what I would assume would be the interests of NHGRI council members and, and, and public who would want to come to this meeting. Um, I also should mention that it's pretty short, so if you feel like interrupting along the way, please don't hesitate. I really don't mind. Um, and there should be time for questions at the end if you don't. Um, so uh, like an HDR, I am sure, NIMH has a mission. NIMH's mission, though, uh, is tailored, of course, to the illnesses of the individuals uh, who suffer from them, uh, for which we're entrusted. Um, we envision a world in which mental illnesses are prevented and cured, um, and uh, that's our vision. And our mission is to, to transform the understanding of treatment of mental understanding and treatment of mental illnesses through basic and clinical research, paving the way for that prevention, um, for recovery for those who currently suffer, and for cure. And uh, we take these words seriously. And and uh, particularly, I want to highlight the word transform, because I think that's. Uh, that's the way I approach the job. I think we need to really transform uh, mental illness care in this country from multiple perspectives. Uh, as Eric mentioned, we're the lead institute at the NIH uh, for research on mental illnesses. Um, we could argue forever about what composes a mental illness compared to other neurologic disorders. Uh, but uh, for now, it's mostly a negotiation process. And IMH supports more than 3,000 research grants and contracts at universities and other institutions across the country and overseas. And we also have a robust intramural research program that supports about 600 scientists, primarily on the Bethesda campus, but in other locations as well. Uh, this is my first year as institute director. And I was fortunate enough to inherit an institute that was on sound footing. And so my primary goal in this first year is to listen and to learn. I'm, of course, interested in listening and learning from all uh, constituencies, including this one. If you have uh, suggestions or imperatives to, to give me, I'm happy to, to hear. Um, 
And in that context, uh, I guess this slide's a little bit old already. I have no immediate plans to launch rapid or dramatic changes in direction. Although as I approach my first anniversary in September, uh, we'll see what, what might happen then. Um, I take the helm of the NIMH not at, at, uh, uh, at a very fortunate time, not just because it was running very well under my predecessor, but also because we have an astounding array of technologies at our hand to study the brain and to intervene in, in, in brain function. Um, we have finally begun to get genetic clues. At this point, they probably are just that, clues but they are really important clues that uh, are going to, I hope, enable us to break open the neurobiology that underlies much of psychiatric illness. Um, and uh, and th these technologies and these clues, I think, lead, to dr lead directly to approaches to characterize and observe the connections between circuits and behavior in the context of mental illness. Um, that's been evident in my own work, which I won't go into today, but I'm happy to talk about if you'd like. Um, and the work of many, many other investigators supported by the NIMH. Um, that said, we face tremendous complex challenges. Uh, we have a limited knowledge base about what's really there in the neurobiology of psychiatric illness. Um, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's really um, one of the main reasons for that is a diagnostic uncertainty, which is actually, actually, that's not the right way to put it. We actually can be really good with our diagnoses, at least in terms of, uh, of agreement across you know, far-flung doctors who've seen the same patients. Um, but what we, what we have is lack or uncertainty as to whether those diagnoses categor uh, actually categorize mental illness in a way that adheres to the natural bound boundaries of illness, um, and therefore adheres to the, n the underlying neurobiology. And although we have treatment options, uh, we have actually lots of different kinds of treatment options. They are limited in their efficacy and their generalizability. And, uh, and, and choosing a treatment is, uh, is always, I was going to say nearly always, but really it's always uh, a try the first thing that occurs to you. And if that doesn't work, try something else. So these are challenges that, that are probably uh, not unique to NIMH, but uh, and, and to psychiatrists treating their patients uh, as compared to other branches of medicine, but are much more significant than in other branches of medicine. Um, to address those challenges, I'm trying to build uh, what I consider to be a balanced research portfolio. That includes all kinds of measures of diversity, but it also includes diversity, I think, of time frames, where we're trying to um, conduct research and, and, sp and sponsor research at NIMH that will affect the patients of today, and that will affect the patients of tomorrow in the medium and long term. Um, an example of a short-term goal that we have at, of high priority is suicide prevention. These are curves of the suicide rates per 100,000 people, broken out by sex, uh, but, um, but also totaled in the middle. And what you can see, of course, is that these graphs are almost linear, up, linearly pointing upward with no change in sight. And I could put the 2015 and 20. Actually, we don't quite have the 2016 data yet. I can put the 2015 data on there, and again, they are increasing. So uh, we need to do something about this, uh, what I would consider to be an epidemic of suicide in the country, uh, over 44,000 deaths in 2015 from a suicide. And we have tools to address this. Um, so this is a short-term goal because it's a matter of figuring out how we implement those tools on a wider basis. On the medium-term goal, there's tremendous knowledge emerging in preclinical models, most, most, most uh, dominantly in rodents and, in fact, most dominantly in mice, to understand the relationships between neural circuit function and behavior and to be able to manipulate those neural circuits to alter behavior. And one can easily imagine two things coming out of this knowledge base. One, to, uh, we could imagine identifying molecular targets in specific circuits that would modulate those circuits in one way or another, and therefore apply uh, traditional pharmacological techniques to try to develop novel therapeutics. And we can also imagine developing the technology to intervene on a circuit basis in humans in a way that we can only do so in rodents now. Both of those approaches require more focus than we have currently in the NIMH portfolio. And so I'm looking forward to working towards, um, uh, towards, the, uh, towards enhancing our ability to translate circuit knowledge into treatments on the medium term. Uh, in the long term, I have a, a, a goal uh, of trying to enhance the role 
of computation and theory in psychiatric neuroscience. This includes uh, methods which the NIH GR GRI community is well aware of, such as data mining, big data, um, and computational approaches to the same. But it also includes uh, aspects of theory and computation that are more unique to the brain. I shouldn't say unique to the brain at all, but, but really more <coughs> unique in terms of, the, of what they can do for us in the brain where biophysical modeling and modeling of circuits and how they function in a mathematical basis has the potential to really transform our understanding of brain circuits. Um, but we're, we're not going to be able to do a good job of that unless we recruit more people with computational skills, be it from the mathematics or physics areas or engineering areas, to study the problems of psychiatry. And so that's a major thing that I would like to do, which I hope will have long-term benefits. And just to give you one example of how I think computation can enhance psychiatry, um, I'll turn to a slightly big data way. We have this new initiative, or reasonably new initiative, that was, again, started by my predecessor called Research Domain Criteria, which is an attempt to address this issue that I brought up earlier about the question of whether our diagnoses in psychiatry adhere to the natural boundaries of, of disease in the brain. And, um, and, and an attempt to ask that, basically, is, uh, is represented in the Research Domain Criteria Initiative, where we try to break down behavior into its component parts apply a set of uniform measures to, um, to assay that behavior in a transdiagnostic fashion and ask whether that will teach us more about the underlying neurobiology or perhaps be more clinically useful. Either one of those things would be, would be nice. Um, I actually am really interested in using a data-driven, bottom-up approach on very, very large data sets uh, with computationally informed behavioral tasks that adhere to the categories of RDoC to ask the simple but really difficult, simple question to ask, difficult question to address, is RDoC actually helpful? Um, and I think we have the potential to do that if we can, if we can roll out a big data approach, uh, a data-driven approach to trying to understand how behavior is split up in the brain in terms of function. So next, I, find, I, I want to talk, turn to genetics. Again, I, this is the part that I think will be most germane to NHGRI. Um, and this is a, a slide that I've been showing for, I don't know, 15 years in one way, shape, or form, maybe 20, and which I actually thought of longer ago than that in graduate school when I decided to study the neuroscience, neuroscience in mice because I knew mice would be genetically tractable organisms. And it's sort of the promise of genetics. You could, you know, put any field's data in this, but, um, but this is written up for the brain, right? So genes, as we all know, uh, don't code for disease phenotypes directly. Genes code for molecules uh, which are expressed in the cells and uh, in cells uh, that, in the brain anyway, work together in, the f in circuits. Those circuits are linked together in far-flung neural systems, and those, it's activity and function in those neural systems that produce behavior. So if we think of a genetic mutation that predisposes to a disease phenotype, in order to really understand how that mutation leads to the disease phenotype in the brain, we need to understand the effects of that mutation at multiple levels in the nervous system. Um, the, uh, the trick, of course, in psychiatry as well as in other illnesses for that matter is we don't know which of these levels, the cell, the circuit, or the system, is going to be most relevant for our treatments. We have treatments in psychiatry tried and true ones like ECT or more modern ones like repetitive TMS that address systems level function. We have other treatments that uh, target molecular processes in the cell. And uh, as I told you before, we have emergent methods, at least in preclinical models, to manipulate specific circuits. So we don't know which level of understanding will lead to treatment fastest in psychiatry, and that's why this imperative of understanding mutation to disease phenotype across multiple levels is so important. However, uh, and so I, I want to just, you know, to concretize that for a moment, turn to, I could have shown my own work, but, uh, you know, now that uh, my privilege as NIMH director is to be able to claim credit for everyone else's work, too. Uh, so I'll tell you about uh, some really creative work done by a friend and colleague, Stanislav Zakarenko at St. Jude's, where he's been studying a mouse model of the 22Q11 syndrome. It was mentioned earlier in, uh, in Eric's talk. This, as most of you know, is a is a de novo copy number variant, and as many of you know, this variant predisposes to a psychotic disorder otherwise uh, indistinguishable from schizophrenia. And uh, 
Uh, Dr. Zankarenko, as, as well as others, including myself, have studied a mouse model of this that lacks the corresponding section of chromosome 16. And he studied the, um, a particular circuit in that mouse, uh, the circuit that leads from the auditory thalamus, labeled here as MGV, to the auditory cortex, here as ACX. And he does so by stimulating that pathway in a slice and recording from the auditory cortical responses. And what he's shown in the mutants here in red is that for every uh, ounce, if you will, of stimulation in the pathway leading into the cortex from the thalamus, you get a increasing response as you increase the strength of stimulation uh, to each of those stimulations. But it, you do so at a slower, lower slope in the, in the mutants. So in effect, what we say is that this thalamocortical input is decreased in its efficacy in the mutant. And, um, and what's intriguing is uh, he can rescue that uh, intensity deficit by overexpressing a particular microRNA, which is uh, downregulated for various reasons in this particular mutant. Now, um, that's the latest of actually what's a series of uh, really wonderful studies that Dr. Zakarenko has carried out, which suggest a, at least part of this pathway for mutation disease in the 22Q11 mouse, which is that a lack of one of the genes in that region, uh, a regulator of microRNA synthesis, leads to decreased microRNA expression of a number of microRNAs. But one of them, that one that I just mentioned that he used, actually is important for downregulating the re uh, dopamine receptor specifically in thalamic uh, neurons. And so when you don't have enough of that miRNA, you increase the expression of that dopamine 2 receptor specifically in these neurons. And therefore, they bind dopamine, and, uh, and uh, the function of the DRD2 receptor is to inhibit uh, the efficacy of those term axon terminals in the cortex. So what you get is weakened inputs to the auditory cortex. And there's various reasons to hypothesize, and at this point, it's really just a hypothesis, sorry, that that, uh, that, that might be related to psychosis. And the easiest to explain reason uh, is what might be that without this uh, corresponding input, the auditory cortex is left to generate its own activity. And we do know that uh, individuals with schizophrenia, when they hallucinate, have in, uh, inappropriately elevated levels of activity in the auditory cortex. So this uh, pathway is one potential pathway by which that mutation, the 22Q11 microdeletion, might lead to uh, a psychotic episode. Um, and so that's really nice and powerful when you're talking about certain kinds of mutations, like the large effect size mutation that 22Q11 microdeletion represents. And this was the promise of genetics, as I said, that I've been talking about for quite some time in my own work. But of course, uh, this is the reality of schizophrenia genetics. Um, so each, uh, as you guys know better than I what a Manhattan plot is, so I won't belabor the explanation except to say that, you know, uh, this paper back in 2014 suggested there were 108 different schizophrenia-associated genetic loci. Now the number is probably closer to 180. The predicted number based on the statistics, if you could, I don't know, genotype everybody in the entire planet would be about 2,000 loci, which is a substantial chunk, as you know, of the human genome. And each of these loci contributes a very, very small amount of risk. Uh, uh, the biggest one here, the MHC, may be as much as a 20 percent increase in risk from a, re a relative ratio, uh, uh, odds ratio of 1.2, but these are still small amounts of risk, and it's really hard to move, not impossible, but hard to move from this kind of plot to an understanding of the neurobiology that leads to the illness. And uh, Eric asked me to throw this piece in. We have in the brain, like probably most of the rest of the body, an important uh, additional complicating factor, and that is that in the brain it's been shown that there's tremendous somatic mosaicism. So, you know, in this inherited mutations like the 22Q, they're present, actually, uh, 22Q is not familial, but it's present in uh, the um, in the, uh, in the, actually, we think it's probably coming from mostly from the sperm of the father, but in the zygotes. And then, um, sorry, it's transmitted to the entire uh, organism that this is your somatic cell division. 
You can also have early or later somatic mutations, and what's been shown if you look at brain cells is that uh, brain cells have a lot of these late somatic mutations. I don't know if it's any more than any other cell type in the body, but the brain undergoes tremendous numbers of cell divisions to produce the uh, complexity and, and actually the, the, just the size, sheer number of cells that make it up. And so there are lots of these somatic mutations that are found. And if you're interested, I suggest you, you go look at the review that was just published in Science that details the methods, the, the really, really careful methodology that's been done by NIMH researchers and, and researchers funded by other institutes, in, including, I'm sure, NHGRI, to demonstrate that these somatic mosaic, uh, these somatic mutations really are mutations and not mistakes of the, of the, of the process used to find them. So that leads to a likely complexity that is much more challenging and daunting than the simple linear picture that I showed you before, where we have a whole bunch of genes, and for that matter, perhaps even genes different in different cells. Uh, I'm throwing in some environmental factors because we do know that the genetics don't explain everything. Um, and then uh, we really have a patchwork or a mesh or a network of, of, of potential pathways leading from these genes to uh, also multiple phenotypes, because another thing that I didn't emphasize with that Manhattan plot is that many of those, uh, uh, many of those uh, loci also are linked to, um, in, in the schizophrenia GWAS, are also linked to bipolar. Um, so we have a, a multiple potential phenotypes and a, and a web that leads one way, and features of this web could be convergence, where multiple, uh, in, multiple mutations or insults uh, affect a singular process. Uh, you can have divergence, where a singular process at one level might lead to multiple phenotypes at another level. And what we hope for in the neurobiology of mental disorders is some form of critical convergence, maybe not all, but at least some of these processes might converge onto phenotypes that we can study and manipulate uh, in, uh, in both preclinical and clinical uh, models. So uh, this li likely complexity, it's frustrating, but we hope to be able to manage it, and that's what we're faced with now, actually, as we have these numbers of different risk factors. And so we've convened at NIMH uh, a work group on genomics, which really asking the questions of how do we prior prioritize the neuro uh, neurobiologic studies of, of the genetic signals we currently have, what are the best experimental and computational tools to move forward with that characterization, um, and how can we leverage different uh, population-based cohorts to enable large-scale genomic discovery with a level of phenotypic understanding that we can't currently with the GWAS studies uh, cobbled together as they are. And another question is, should we start using dimensional phenotypes, uh, such as our doc and, and behavior, to further delineate the genetic architecture of mental disorders? Um, we put out a number of, um, of funding announcements aimed at trying to um, uh, spur on um, what we call an integrative approach or a convergent approach to studying neuroscience of these, uh, of these uh, genomic um, uh, signals. Um, with that ideally that span multiple levels and that look at multiple causes and multiple phenotypes out the other end. Uh, and if you're interested in sort of the, the generic approach, I, I'll point you to this Nature Neuroscience paper uh, review by Stainsberg and Zogby where they discussed how, how to try to con uh, uh, um, apply multiple approaches to the study of genomic clues in psychiatrically relevant disorders. And um, I think I'll skip that for now. And um, so, you know, if I could just summary, summarize the road ahead for me anyway, is to pri prioritize excellent science and within that realm diversity, particularly of time scale. Um, I look forward to learning and working with all the constituencies of NIMH to address the challenges that are facing. Um, and I think uh, to, to try to build momentum towards treatments that can change the lives of individuals, families, and communities affected by mental disorders. So, Thank you for listening. I'm happy to entertain questions or, uh, or challenges, uh, uh, whatever, whatever you have for me. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. I'm sure there's going to be questions. I will I, go ahead, Carol. I have several myself, but go ahead. So genetics and computational, two of my favorite things. So. Um, to integrate data across the different scales that you're going to need to do so, um, and to because these phenotypes are so complex, I mean, the challenge, the computational stuff is a challenge, but really the integration of different data types from different sources when the vocabulary is used to describe the phenotypes and, and 
you know, even something like schizophrenia, I suppose there's like a zillion different ways to describe what that is. So bringing the data together so that you get actual signal instead of spurious signal is, is going to be a big challenge. So in the discussions and in your thinking about bringing in the computational component to this uh, research program, what are your thoughts on what are the, the data and data standards that you're going to need to actually achieve that kind of vision? So uh, there's several different answers to your question, but I'm going to stick to the sort of data standards part, and maybe you can force me to elaborate in other areas if you'd like. Um, uh, and even there, there's a couple of different answers. So one is, of course, working with the existing Fenex toolkit stuff to at least get information out there about what we think are unifiable approaches to that. Another is to continue doing what we're doing with our databases, which is try to encourage and enforce people to use some form of common data element elements. Uh, so we have in our databases at NIH the requirement that when you submit, you work with our coders to um, at the very least, if you've done, you know, if different people have done different sorts of tests for schizophrenia and uh, have different, you know, symptom domains, you know, scaled in different ways, to uh, tell us which one is about, say, severity of hallucinations and give us the numbers that you've used so that they get coded into a d element, even if it's not the exact same test, at least you know where the scale for auditory hallucination severity is. And, and we have a way of translating between the different codes. So that's, one, that's, that's among some of the approaches. Um, more promisingly, uh, there are a number of different efforts, including one by the, uh, the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium and the Stanley Center, um, to actually roll out uh, wide-scale standardized phenotyping. Um, their effort is more around cognition. We are developing our own that will piggyback, hopefully, onto the Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, where we'll, we'll actually try to cover all the bases of RDOC to get databases that are actually acquired in a uniform way. So there's both trying to retrofit old studies um, and trying to create large databases with, uh, with new data that's actually purpose-built. So, so one of the ideas then is the researchers that you fund going forward, there will be some sort of requirement to adhere to the standards so that the data they generate. Yeah, what we integrated. haven't figured out is if it's going to be a requirement or whether we, you know, there's a couple of different approaches. One is to require, and another is to make it just so useful that they'd be stupid not to. <laughs> and I kind of prefer that approach, which has worked more or less for us in the Human Connectome Project in terms of developing a standard for imaging and image processing that's so useful that now more and more of the imaging world is just adopting it. So I think there's both those approaches. And then the third approach that we're trying, as I said, is to develop our own databases that are huge and compelling to allow, you know, yes, there, it means there's an investment up front, but on the other hand, the payout in the end is that anybody with a computer can access the data and with a, you know, a clever mind and computational abilities can study that database. So there's, you know, so there's multiple approaches to the problem. Um, only one of which would be enforcing, and you know, this is a field that's really hard to enforce. So. Um, we heard earlier from Eric that one of the major groups of disorders being sequenced is part of the common disease grants or, or neuropsychiatric. And so I was wondering how are the two institutes interacting around that data generation and then analysis? So Eric can probably answer that much better than I can. We had a meeting on this where I was just, you know, but where I've been informed about the different collaborations. Let's just, I'll say, just say there are lots of ways that we're collaborating. And one of the more intriguing ones, I think, is going, going forward is trying to figure out how to maintain in these databases that we're generating in a way that makes sense and that's integrative, that allows, you know, different people coming in with different studies to be collaborated. I don't know if you want to say anything I think more Adam's going to come to Microsoft. I think he's in the best position. Describe. In terms of concrete things, right now there's some NIMH data in a pool that's going to be joint called with some CCDG, CCDG data. So that's the concrete thing that we're doing right now in September school. Eric? Going, going back to your I first or second slide about the mission, you know, why are we doing this? Have you engaged the AMP 
program and is there an AMP mental health initiative to turn genetic discoveries into therapies or even dreaming uh, preventive measures? Um, so that's a great question. We had had uh, one proposal for the AMP around schizophrenia biomarkers. I'm not sure if it was really genetically based. That didn't quite cut the mustard. So we didn't get funding there. I think that's an, uh, an uh, there are lots of opportunities now that we have specific genes. One can imagine, well, we don't have, we don't have many specific genes really. What we have is loci, right? But, um, but as we move towards uh, more and more identifying putative genes for those, uh, we can imagine doing something on a large scale to screen for modulators and test them in preclinical models. One of the big problems is that um, I don't think we've got, and this could be controversial in my field, so I apologize to anyone listening on the web access who completely disagrees with me. You don't get the chance to refute me. I don't think we have the, the preclinical models that we need for that kind of an effort because, I, frankly, I wouldn't trust that a drug that works in a mouse or uh, or a rat model uh, is other than a D2 antagonist where we know really well that they'll work is really going to give us something novel in the area of say antipsychotics or um, uh, or autism where we have the best uh, genetic clues. Uh, that said, I, I think that's one thing we really want to try to develop is um, models that will be predictive in that way and it, and it's certainly worth an effort to try to start categorizing which of these targets, which of these genes are druggable first and then figuring out whether any of, if, if those that are druggable might be, um, might be treatment targets. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Certainly mental health disorders raise a whole host of ethical, legal, social issues, both in clinical care as well as in research. So I'm wondering whether NIMH has had any initiatives in that domain or whether you're considering uh, supporting initiatives uh, uh, in the ELSI uh, domain. Um, so through the BRAIN initiative, we support a number of different neuroethics um, efforts, including some initiatives that we're just starting to put out um, to define the role, um, to, def to, to, to identify uh, the neuroethical dilemmas that novel technologies bring up. Um, at NIMH, we've tried to stick closely to our mission around mental health. And so we haven't gone very far into the domains of, say, forensic neuroscience or other things, which I agree are important, um, but which many of our constituents might see as a distraction. Um, so I don't have any plans currently to expand our investments in those areas. Thanks for the presentation. Um, as you your last comment about trying to stick within the domains of mental health. As you know, mental health has lots of comorbidities. Uh, maybe the greatest one is drug abuse. So are you working with uh, NIDA and what's your yeah, thoughts so on, on crossing domains there? So we have a number of efforts then in which we collaborate with NIDA. We, those could be accelerated and increased. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I've gotten to know Nora pretty well over the last six months and look forward to trying to figure out ways that we can enhance that collaboration. There are lots of very, very timely issues in which uh, mental health and, and substance abuse overlap. One of those, for example, is the epidemic of opioid abuse, um, which has at least a, one, at least, uh, has a considerable component of psychiatric self-medication, I think. Um, although I, I think at this point we don't really know that for sure. I want to come back to the previous question. I say because I should add that one thing, one area in which we're very interested in the legal implications of mental illness and vice versa, is the fact that in these United States, um, the legal system, uh, the, the the correction system, I should say, is the largest mental health care provider, and so um, that's an area that we are deeply interested in, and we have a number of efforts to try to. Um, to try, it, at the very least, to have quality care delivered by that system, but also to try to figure out ways that we might be able to uh, get people out of that system and into the mental health care system. So I actually had one comment and then I had a question. So my, my comment, which may be more of an offer, is I, the, it sounds like you created a working group of your council around genomics, if I understood correctly. Yeah. 
I, my offer would be, it's easy for me to say, it's people around this table, I am quite sure if, if, if there was any desire, any interest in interacting either with this council or any of our working groups, one could imagine you'll bump up against things that, that you might have might more input on, and I'm quite certain the network of people around the, and the, the people around this table and the networks that they're associated would be happy to help at any time. So thank I you. That would be a great I, I will, opportunity. Great. I will relay that on. It was actually set up even before I came on. Um, I'm, I'm, I bet anything there are members of that work group that are oh, your grantees. Uh, that are your grantees and that are uh, and or that have served on your council. But I'll relay that on to. Um, to the folks who are heading up the work group. That's a great question. The question I was going to ask you, which is as much about um, asked uh, to a practicing psychiatrist, but also as obviously an IMH director, it really reminds me of a topic that was very relevant for a workshop we had last week. We have a, a genomic medicine working group of our council, and they put on a series of meetings over the handful of years uh, since I became director. And last week we had a two day meeting focused around pharmacogenomics and the current state of pharmacogenomics. And I, I guess I'd be curious to hear from you. In, 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 in many ways, it, there's, there's so many questions in so many different areas of pharmacogenomics, but obviously in, in the treatment of, of psych psychiatric disorders, that's an area where there uh, seems to be great promise, but maybe not, maybe not as much proven. I guess I'm curious what your opinion of the state of the field for psychiatry, number one, and then number two, on the research side of it, what NIMH is doing in that arena. We're trying to define our interests and efforts in this arena going forward, although many of these applications are very disease-specific and are wondering how to sort of move that forward. Yeah, so I think the, um, a, a, couple, I have a couple of thoughts along that way. First of all, there are, there are companies out there right now that are selling, as you know, pharmacogenetic genomic testing direct to patients or through their, through their providers uh, targeted at psychiatric disease. And I've actually investigated just one or two of those companies on behalf of actually patients of mine, or even since I've been here, former patients of mine who've asked me about them. And I have seen very little in the way of actual um, rigorous data to back up claims that they will improve patient care. Um, and as you probably know, most of them are based around the enzymes that process uh, drugs. So even if they are efficacious, really, that what they're doing is um, is simply, you know, um, putting numbers onto something that we're already aware of in terms of that some patients are better metabolizers than others. And in how accurately they're doing that, I don't know. Um, that said, obviously, um, in psychiatry, where we have such heterogeneity within a disorder and where we are applying the same set of uh, of psychotropic medications to multiple disorders, it would make total sense to try a pharmacogenetic approach. And, we have funded a number of studies in pharmacogenetics over the, the, the past several years. Um, I haven't seen anything come out of it that's particularly groundbreaking, so that should, you know, that colors my opinion a little bit. Uh, my concern, as I'm sure is your concern, is that, you know, if we need uh, 50,000 patients to find a decent genetic structure of schizophrenia, then we probably need that many to figure out which drugs work, and we just don't have treatment trials that big. Uh, I, I guess in the back of my mind, that's the second stage hope of, a, of programs like the Precision Medicine Initiative, where you could have a few hundred thousand people, and you could have 20 or 30,000 of them, hopefully, who have you know, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder and who've been exposed to various antipsychotics or mood stabilizers and ask you know, whether different types have different effects based on genetics. Um, uh, I don't know even if that would be powered enough, um, but, but that's, you know, my, my main concern. Um, and then again, one can use these big data techniques to try to extract information, but the problem with the big data techniques is that, um, you know, the more variables you put in, the more subjects you need uh, to put in as well in order to be able to get statistically robust output. So, um, so I, I guess I'm... Um, I'm not particularly sanguine about the opportunities there. I, I, I'm, I could, I'm happy to be convinced if someone comes along with a, with a clever approach. Uh, just to continue that theme for a second, I, I, you know, uh, I, sh I share your um, uh, skepticism might not be the right word, but the, your, your sort of uh, uh, the, the, your recognition of the, of the computational challenges. That said, um, as a as a as a lay, layman, but a pharmacogeneticist, I would put it to you that uh, 
responses to antidepressant therapy and antipsychotic therapies are, are notoriously variable. And there is a downside that is, uh, I, I, I don't want to lecture you about this because you know much more about it than I do, that, that there's a sense in a, in a general medicine community that, well, you know, if one antidepressant doesn't work, then the next one will work. But there is a downside to sort of leaving people untreated for a long time. So, so while the computational challenges are considerable, uh, I, I think it is a, a something that uh, that that our institute and your institute probably ought to start to chew on. I, I'm a big believer in the idea that if you understand the underlying genetic architecture of the disease, then the pharmacogenetics may more readily follow. And there is this other piece, the pharmacokinetic piece, that that is common to antipsychotic drugs, anti antidepressant drugs, antiarrhythmic drugs, anti-fever drugs, whatever. So that, 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 that piece is a, is a common pharmacogenetic piece. But there's the disease-specific stuff that I think, uh, uh, you know, ought to be a challenge that we ought to address, because that's, that's what people need. So I, I agree entirely. Um, I think um, our, uh, our, our priority now, and when I say a priority, I don't mean at all to imply that it's the only thing that we will fund. Our priority is on studies that try to break down uh, disease into what, what we hope are biotypes, you know, uh, uh, subcategories that may be more easily studied both from a uh, treatment and neurobiology perspective, that's both of them already then, and also a, um, uh, a genetic perspective and a pharmacogenetic perspective. Our hope is that we'll get bigger effect sizes and, and the like in that way that we can start asking these questions with more power with fewer groups. And, and I should say that at the outset, you know, underpowered studies will work if there's a real magic bullet. Was that what you meant to do with your finger there, <laughs> right? I think underpowered studies will, will confuse us more than... Well, underpowered studies will confuse us. On the other hand, like, you know, if there's, if there's something out there that really is a huge effect size, then we will we won't see it if we don't do the study. So um, so again, I'm I'm open to clever designs and uh, and some exploration in that area. Um, I leave it to the experts, which would include you folks, to tell me whether it's already been, you know what's already been tried, so that we don't duplicate things. Yeah, and if I could just just add to that, Josh. Um, in, interestingly, pharmacogenetic uh, variation actually is pretty common, and and also is pretty strong. And so, so you don't need the huge sample sizes that you need for some other things. The challenge is getting an adequate treatment response that that's measurable and reproducible. And I think that's where we could really. Yeah, and that's a huge challenge in psychiatry that we hope subtyping and or throwing out the DSMs and uh, from a biologic perspective, not from a clinical perspective, but, uh, you know, move, uh, but starting with a different way of classifying might help us get to more robust treatment responses that we can then study with uh, smaller groups and be adequately powered. We've had enough budget discussion here, so I don't really want a budget item here. but. Uh, What's your philosophy regarding investigator-initiated versus program-initiated uh, projects? Uh, you know, so I think uh, uh, in psychiatry, um, we have a, 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 we're blessed with um, a, a really good investigator base, uh, uh, particularly on the neurobiology side. But you know, I see a lot of wonderful young investigators on the clinical side as well who are creative and coming up with new ideas, and, and it's really important that the majority of our funding goes to investigator-initiated funds. That said, I think there are ways we can tweak those investigator applications to adhere more to the idea that we want to try to make progress and, don't, and not try to um, delve deeper just for the sake of delving deeper. Um, yes, we fund basic studies that are really all about basic neuroscience. Um, but we also want to make progress, and, and there are things that I, that I keep asking my program staff. Um, I ask a lot of so what's and what's next around, about our grants to make sure that at least we know what the investigator wants to do next, at least we know why the investigator thinks it's important, and then we can ask ourselves if we think it's important as well. Um, I do think, though, there are there are places where we don't get enough applications. Like, for example, on our implementation, we don't get enough applications in implementation science 
where we're trying to apply the methods that we know work. And so we have to put out applications, uh, a you know, program announcements there. Um, on the computation side, we're going to try to be aggressive to, as I said, to bring in people into the NIMH sphere that are not currently in the NIMH sphere. So they're air targeted areas. And then I'm going to take the liberty of answering a different question than the one you asked, but I thought you were going there is about small science versus big science. Because I think, and I'll, the reason I'll take the liberty is because big science is program initiated all the time, right? Um, so I, I, what I like to do from the big science uh, program initiated stuff is to try to create resources that will foster better small science. Um, akin to the, you know, mapping the human genome. You know, there's now, I'm sure you guys are finding tons and tons of individual investigator groups to, to that, that use uh, data that come from the Human Genome Project. So uh, we want to build things like the one thing I was talking about before, a, a, a large database of phenotypes that's linked to potential genotypes and to EMR, et cetera, that investigators can mine. And what I'd like, rather than funding some big effort to do the science around it, I look at it as funding the data gathering and then putting, making the data public and then funding individual investigators to mine that data. Let me ask one more question. Um, we love uh, big science stuff. <laughs> uh, um, but I, it, while, since we have you here, can you just give a, like a one to two minute summary of the current state of the brain initiative? Because we don't hear that much about it. Yeah, sure. But it would be just fun to know, just sort of even programmatically, budgetarily, where things. Yeah, yeah. So the good news is, a uh, the brain uh, initiative at the late in the latest FY17 uh, budget actually got an extra hundred million dollars that um, that uh, that help us get closer to the original plan of about four hundred million dollars a year. Uh, I I don't think we're there yet this year, but we're um, we're much closer than we would have been without it. Um, we've been going now for about four years. Um, there, uh, all the grants are, are come in, in in response to um, program initiated announcements, but there are they're written in such a way that we get a lot of creative stuff. We've spent the last four years trying to encourage tool building, and those tool build tool, tool building operations are in uh, we're really a bunch of areas, but the two for sake of time, I'll mention two and specifically one is tools that will enable us to monitor brain activity. Um, different calls for, you know, preclinical versus, you know, human, uh, but uh, on a, a vast time, a vast uh, spatial temporal, uh, sorry, vast spatial scale and very fine temporal scale. So massively multi, multi parallel electrical recordings, optical recordings, and all kinds of other creative stuff. Uh, another one which is uh, sort of in parallel is tools that will enable us to categorize and characterize all the different cell types of the brain. and. There are tremendous progress has been made using all kinds of single cell technology, a single cell transcriptomics especially, to characterize uh, brain cell types. Um, one of the interesting things you might be uh, fascinating to know is that it looks like from the early returns in the Allen Brain Center where they're actually transcriptomically prof transcript they're profiling the transcriptomes of single cells as well as patching them doing some basic neurophysiology is that you can have, at least as you can tell in a single cell, which I know is not that deep, uh, you can have two cells with pretty much identical transcriptomes with different physiologies um, in a dish. I, I don't know how that works or if that's true, but, um, but it's fascinating. So um, this gives us actually, I think from the NIMH's perspective, the, the chance to really do some uh, deep neurobiologic dives at a single level, a cell level and try to use, do what we're calling sort of um, uh, genome-wide neurobiology or genomic neurobiology or transcriptomic neurobiology to understand these gen gene hits that we're getting. So anyway, the, those are two two major technologies. We're now at a at a pivot point uh, in the in the brain initiative where in the next year or two we're going to be starting out putting out more announcements that encourage investigators to use these tools. Well, first to disseminate these tools, and second to use these tools to answer uh, uh, questions in basic neuroscience. And that I think will really open up the gate to, to being able to um, use these tools for disease-specific processes that the individual institutes might want to fund. And, and just say a couple sentences about the oversight of that of that project yeah. in terms of which institutes. And yeah. So, so there's uh, I think 11 institutes and centers that that fund different uh, uh, parts. The main institutes are the NIMH and the uh, NINDS. And uh, Walter and I nominally chair the, uh, the group of, of IC directors that gets together once a month to provide direct oversight. 
Uh, grants are given out by individual institutes that, with money that's divvied out to them by the Brain Initiative. And, uh, and so uh, the individual councils actually uh, provide a, a counselor oversight, although there is a, a, a working group of the, of, a, it's called a multi-council working group that also serves uh, to advise Walter and I and the rest of the IC directors. Um, we're, we've been searching for a brain uh, director of the Brain Initiative who would sit in NINDS but would uh, serve uh, to replace Walter and I as the chairs of that IC group. And, um, or I shouldn't say replace, but advise us in that capacity. And um, that, uh, that was put on hold because of the higher, um, a hiring freeze, but we're hoping to be able to move forward with that soon. Gail? Yeah. Um, hi. Um, so this has been fascinating, um, and good luck. Thanks. Uh, um, I want to return to the question about your, your statement that you weren't interested in a starting an LC program in, in your institute. And um, I was fortunate enough to have a postdoc um, a couple of years ago who got a K99 ROO award. He had, he was probably the most degreed postdoc I ever had. He had a PhD in neuroscience. Um, he had a law degree and a master's in bioethics. So why he came to our program is really, never, nobody could figure out. But he did get a, um, a uh, a K99 award to look at um, people, to look at, uh, to study psychiatric um, genomics um, in a project that was ongoing in uh, Pennsylvania in, uh, um, among individuals with really, uh, who are long, mostly in long-term care facilities with really psychotic, um, mostly diagnosed as schizophrenia, but not necessarily actually having schizophrenia um, patients. and. In my postdoc's project, he's now on the faculty at Baylor School of Medicine. My, his project is about informed consent and return of results uh, to people, either their, um, uh, their um, surrogates or themselves if they had capacity, sort of what kinds of things one ought, ought to do, um, how to get informed consent to participate in whole exome sequencing, and then what to do about return of results. And as you've been talking, it struck me that um, you might be very interested in hearing about this. Um, other kinds of projects that are funded by the LC program, I mean, you know, we're very, we've all been very caught up with return of results issues, but there's um, really interesting LC projects in biobanking, and, you know, obviously informed consent's always been of great interest. So while you might not want to start a program, you might want to link up in a variety of ways with the LC program. Um, so I would just kind of offer that, um, That's and I, this guy in particular, his yeah. name is um, Gabe Lacero Munoz. Um, you, he would probably be delighted to talk about his project to some of your folks. So I just want to suggest that. Thanks, I appreciate that. And let me just say that um, you know we do have efforts in these kinds of areas, particularly in intersection with mental illness and capacity. Um, so it's not that we don't have anything in that area, but. Um, but I think it'd be great for us to work together with the existing resources to, so that we can learn about how to uh, address these issues in our population. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming, Josh. I knew this would be a productive conversation. I think there are several areas we identified for continued interaction. And uh, once again, I just want to stress, uh, as you even heard on this last issue, or even around LC work, this council is very always very cooperative and interested in, in, in reaching out even beyond our institute and being helpful. So I'm sure if there's particular things you would like to get input from us about, we'd be delighted to be helpful. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Thanks again. Okay. We're going to break for lunch. Let's resume at uh, 1 o'clock, please. Good timing. <laughs>